Thank you very much, Emma, and good evening, everybody. Uh, really, really pleased to be here and introducing Darren today. Um, Darren, uh, Darren Kerr is an uh, Associate Professor of Sexual Cultures and uh, the co-lead for the Screening Sex Project. Uh, Darren has published on matters of uh, sexual deviancy, uh, pornography, sex, and cultural sensibility. Uh, so it's a, it's really a great pleasure uh, to introduce to this talk, and Darren Darren will be talking about his background before discussing uh, his experiences um, in teaching and researching uh, sex on screen. Some of his uh, most recent work is informed by how uh, film represents and deals with narratives of, of abuse, which will be referred to here. Uh, we will also uh, hear about the Screening Sex Project, which contributed to our recent REF submission. This is a Research Excellence Framework submission from the university and is a forum supported by an international network of scholars researching the politics and representation of sexual cultures. So it's a really, really great pleasure for, uh, for me to introduce Darren today to you and uh, ask him to take the stage please thank you darren okay thank you very much thanks shaman i really appreciate it and just a big uh, a quick thank you to mike and andy and emma as well for, for getting the set up and helping me to get this up thank you to all of you who've come along as well uh i noticed just seeing some of the people coming in some of this may be familiar to you or some of this i've presented at cms as well um uh, so so apologies for that if that's the case but uh, I am going to talk a bit about uh, my background and kind of uh, root into uh, the subjects that I research and kind of write about. Um, but by way of kind of explaining that, uh, I, I want to say a little bit about my publications as well and kind of where we are with the Screening Sex Project by the end of this. Uh, so, so big thank yous to all those people. And especially, I'd like to mention a special thank you to my Dean, uh, Dean of Faculty, Paul Marchbank, who's been incredibly supportive of the kind of work that I do in my research. And has kind of taken it upon himself to kind of watch and vet every single kind of hardcore porn film that I've ever written about, and even things that I haven't as well. And as soon as he could return those, I'd be really grateful as well. But thank you, Paul. I know you're on leave at the moment, but you might have dropped in. Let's see. Anyway, I want to say a few words just to explain, really. So I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm going to make some particular reference to Hard to Swallow and Tainted Love. But just to say, as Shamantak says, uh, I'm associate professor, but also head of the School of Film and Television at Solent University uh, and co-lead the Screening Sex Project, ScreeningSex.com, with, with the uh, amazing Dr. Donna Pevody uh, as well. She said I had to say that. Um, I want you to say a few things about publications just by way of introduction so you know what we're looking at here. You know, this goes back to the, a book called Screen Methods when I, I wrote a piece about uh, Jekyll and Hyde. It was basically about early film adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde, especially focusing on kind of deviancy and why these adaptations seem to take a literary text that had some hints of issues and problems, no explicit kind of sex and violence, and yet the adaptations always kind of focused on that, which had something to do with a Richard Mansfield appearance on stage during the period of uh, the Jack the Ripper murders, actually, in 1888. But it was a fascinating kind of thing to research and look at, and it kind of set me on my way, although my background really goes back to studying Shakespeare and violence. I started off my research really focusing on approaches to violence in Shakespearean text and adaptation. So I've always kind of had kind of one foot in literature, one foot in film, and it's informed a lot of the work that I've done since as well. The Shakespeare stuff was really fascinating for me because I find myself gleefully wanting to take down the whole idea of Shakespeare as high art uh, when its basic grounding is in popular culture and it is kind of uh, rooted in obscenity and in violence and sexual violence and so on. And yet hundreds of years of kind of uh, praise and academic study didn't seem to be that particularly interested, but it certainly influenced my approaches to sex on screen, sex and culture as well. And definitely this piece uh, around kind of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Um, I collaborated with, <coughs> excuse me, uh, again, wonderful Dr. Claire Hines, who's now at UEA, um, on Hard to Swallow, which was basically uh, a very basic kind of approach to thinking about 
rethinking what hardcore pornography and screen actually is uh, and, and what that means. And I'll say a bit more about that kind of later. There's a piece I published in Celebrity Studies. So I'm really interested in these things that are maybe not always about the mainstream hover around those kinds of margins, uh, but are also, you know, horror, violence, sex, pornography, things that I think are, are incredibly well known, but still remain somewhat unknown. In celebrity studies, I co-authored a piece uh, on autoerotic asphyxiation, which I'm sure you're familiar with, not, not terribly familiar with, but this was looking at the cultural attitudes to uh, a number of cases. You may be familiar with, with uh, Michael Hutchins, the MP Stephen uh, Milligan, uh, there was a handful of cases in which people, David Carradine as well, uh, had died as a result of autoerotic asphyxiation, yet there's very little research uh, done into that. And it was a fascinating kind of case study looking at this in the context of, of celebrity, sexual culture, sexual identity, and indeed kind of sexual behavior as well. And then Tainted Love uh, is, is the kind of most recent, which has opened up a whole kind of project Tainted Love focusing on kind of perversion. And I'm going to refer to a piece that was published in that a little bit later around kind of abuse narratives, representations of paedophilia and so on. So that's just a bit of the, the kind of research uh, background really to, to kind of make you aware. But what I want to really kind of begin with is this idea of being uh, almost in the, the wrong place, but with generally the right people in terms of finding my feet. Uh, and, and for any kind of early career researchers out there, who are looking to kind of build and bolster their kind of networking, uh, not to be too afraid of being in the wrong place at what might seem to be the wrong time. I was very fortunate very early on in my career to be approached by an academic, this was when I was at De Montfort University, uh, who asked me whether at very short notice I could fly out to a Shakespeare, a centenary conference uh, of Shakespeare on screen to conduct a couple of interviews for a journal. Uh, and of course, I, I jumped at that chance, like an early career researcher myself, having no idea what the hell I was doing or why or how this would pan out. And so flew out to Malaga on my own. And Frank, I've been very lucky with the travels and trips that, 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 that I've done as well. I can't uh, gloss over that. But it was a real kind of eye opener for me, uh, not least of all, realizing that I was interested in a field that had a lot of Shakespearean scholars that I wasn't interested in, uh, despite the subject. And that's because of a, you know, a very kind of long standing history of what is regarded as kind of, you know, authentic Shakespeare adaptations and so on. And the work I was doing with violence didn't seem to quite fit there. But I had this opportunity. <clears throat> which led to a couple of publications, which I was incredibly grateful for, but did really find myself what I thought was completely in the, the wrong place, or at least not quite uh, uh, for me. Sometime later, I found myself at a conference in Prague, uh, again, incredibly lucky, but again, completely on my own. I opted to kind of do this. I found a conference that had nothing to do with Shakespeare, but everything to do with violence. So I thought maybe this is the place for me to go. So this was kind of navigated, if you're familiar with King Lear and the, the, the gouging of Gloucester's eyeballs, I wrote an entire paper based around different adaptations and how they had tackled popping out Gloucester's eyeballs on screen in a bid to talk about Shakespeare's kind of culture of violence. My recollection of that conference is that uh, I delivered the paper and I think I delivered it well, but I don't think I spoke before the paper. And I don't think I said a word for the rest of the conference kind of after the paper. Uh, and so it was, it, was, it was quite an odd experience. I'd found a space, but certainly not able to say much more. And so much of that was to do with thinking about whether I was in the right place, doing the right thing, even though I had you know, a degree of confidence about the work that, that I was doing and great support from my supervisors uh, at the time. Wind forward a few years and I'm at York St. John uh, at a conference on transnational monstrosity, which I thought, that's amazing, fantastic. I knew a couple of people who were going there, so I thought, this is absolutely great. And it's transnational monstrosity. And at this point, this is when I was first beginning to kind of look at matters of abuse narratives and paedophilia on screen. And I think what greater uh, monster, transnational monster, is there than the paedophile? Uh, and, and I've been researching this and looking at trends in film and so on, and I thought, yes, this is where, where, where I will go to. Um, I found myself on a panel with, with people who were presenting on, on I was presenting on paedophilia alongside people presenting on Pokemon and, um, and Disney's Moana as well. So again, there was this kind of thing about, I'm not sure this is, 
quite where where I should be. Is this where is the place for this 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 kind of stuff and this kind of material? Uh, and though Pokemon and Moana were really interesting uh, papers and so on, there's also one on Hitchcock's The Lodger as well, actually on that on that panel. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure I was where where I should be. And this has been a, a persistent theme, I think, where I've kind of jumped in to to do things like this this talk, frankly. Uh, without thinking about how nervous it makes me feel or how kind of sick to my stomach and thinking what am I doing why do I why do I do these things and it's actually because you just don't know what's going to emerge and that's been a theme that's continued in my pursuit to find a place for my work and for my research and the things that I'm interested in and this is translated into you know attending and being a part of a number of panels and presentations and so on which is included in Southampton specifically uh, getting involved in the cultural city conferences so you may be familiar with the fact that Southampton is going for city of culture bid uh, and there were a couple of conferences that were set up uh, a few years ago just to begin to establish kind of consultation and what that bid might look like in its kind of early early stages uh, and I just thought that's incredible I was, was so interested in that certainly not a home for my research but certainly something I was interested in getting involved in and I was asked at very short notice whether I could chair a panel on diversity which I said yes of course I can and then you know shortly after thinking what am I doing and so you know standing there you know big hairy straight white man uh, uh, <laughs> chairing a panel on diversity but again the kind of untold things that emerged from that were, were, were really incredible really informative this goes as well for a um, a panel I put together about women. This was, I look back at this now, this was in 2011 during one of our Southampton film weeks. And I put together, didn't put it together actually, was asked to get involved in it and people contributed to it. Um, a panel about women in film and television. Uh, and it was, it was brilliant. I really, I loved it, really enjoyed it. Not least of all, because we had a panel of um, women filmmakers and artists who themselves became quite split on these debates about the roles, responsibilities, and so on and so forth about women in film and TV. But these things kind of fascinate me, these contradictions, these uh, moments of contention. The reason I remember it distinctly is because there's uh, um, someone that I've, I've come to really quite love, who I think is amazing, a, a, an academic and an artist named Sarah Filmer. I, I didn't know Sarah Filmer. Those of you who know Sarah Filmer will, will know Sarah Filmer. But I didn't know Sarah Filmer at the time during this when I'm, I'm talking about women in film and TV and having done some research and trying to do, do uh, as, as best I can. And she absolutely took me down. She tore me to pieces in this public forum. Uh, and she did a brilliant job of that, frankly. And I learned so much from that, so much more than I'd learned from uh, reading any number of things around kind of women in film and TV, feminist theory, feminist approaches and so on. And yet again, I find myself in these situations where I'm thinking this is I'm completely the wrong person to be doing this. And yet they seem to kind of work out OK because of being involved and being interested in these. And I'm incredibly grateful to Sarah for that ever since. And, and, and you know, I've spoken on a number of times since then so this isn't really about kind of wrong conferences and wrong panels presentations certainly about panic there's always plenty of of that that's there but it's really more so about what i've learned and how it's kind of shaped the research that i've done and particularly my kind of interests uh, these these conferences and things that i went to and these ones where i didn't seem as though it, it quite fit they, they weren't consciously calculated planned moments of, of, of grand ambition or, or career. Uh, but what I got out of them was so kind of rooted in, in the experience and in, in, in effectively the experiential for want of a better term, that I've continued to do this where I will uh, happily, and I'd encourage anyone to do this, leap before you actually look, take, uh, take the risks uh, and certainly move beyond what is regarded as your field and certainly in some cases what academia regards as your field to take it kind of elsewhere and outwards and that happened by happy accident with, with me but it's become something I've been really quite interested in uh, ever since. So these weren't things that I'd, I'd necessarily kind of planned but they were certainly things that supported my interests and this idea of moving beyond what sometimes can be uh, um, a, a limited kind of field. Uh, for myself, I kind of learned to, in these scenarios, be incredibly open and public 
about having a limited amount of knowledge or indeed like most academics a lot of knowledge about a very little area as well i think what this did was made this is going to sound so egotistical i think and self-centered but it made my work more interesting certainly for me and some of the responses i got as well uh, seemed to make them uh, as though my work was more interesting rather than firmly rooting them in the discipline in the subject area and just with the same kind of sets of, of uh, in some cases, you know, limited fields. The Shakespeare stuff was, a, was a, an excellent kind of example of that. So I'd encourage people to, to really, uh, really do that. It also kind of um, taught me a lot about imposter syndrome. I see a lot of this on social media and a lot of academics who feel this and, and acutely do. And certainly based on background, certainly the background I came from, which was, was a non-academic and, and, and certainly I didn't know anybody uh, who'd even been to university when I went to university. But what I've learned from that in terms of imposter syndrome is, is actually uh, the need to impose for anyone who feels imposter syndrome. I think there's, there's something to be said there about needing to impose and not negatively, but really by way of, of uh, imposing to contribute and to support. And I often think that um, the, the, if you experience imposter syndrome, it's proof that an imposition of sorts is, is really needed in that space or that environment that kind of makes you feel that way. And I wish I'd have known that many years ago and not, not felt so worried about some of the, the, the things that you do as you embark upon this, this odd thing, which is about researching and writing and presenting your work. The point really though is, is, is about what I kind of learned, how you can make things happen really by taking a, a, a significant risk and, and making sure you do that because as this slide says here that image is from the the transnational monsters conference uh steve rawl who ran that is a fantastic chap what happened that came out of that was the, a lady named jill leslie who's the commissioning editor eup approached me after i gave my paper um asking me whether i'd want to turn it into a book and I was like, what? I, I can't, it's no, it's like a few words on a piece of paper, but that has had such an impact and a brilliant relationship now with uh, Jill, Jill at EUP, which has led to a, a, a series of books that we're going to be doing. So you just don't know what's going to emerge from that. And, and I, you know, it may be that I'm not the best advert for career, uh, but I think there's so many people who do kind of jump in think about it later and explore you know, through risk what is actually possible. It's by taking the risks for me that really informed a lot of my teaching and particularly the approach uh, I then took to teaching stuff around sex on screen. Um, this began actually around 2006, 2007. So I did the best part of 10 years of running this module uh, about sex on screen. And again, it was, was something that I was actually really, really well supported. Uh, at, at the university, at Solent. Um, I, I was really unsure about what this was, but felt this absolute need and this drive to have a module that addressed, you know, one of the longest forms of, 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 of film in terms of genre, history, style, approach, and so on. And that pornography particularly has kind of carved a path throughout the history of film and yet has largely or has been, not until recently, it's much, much uh, improved now, largely absent from, from the curriculum, uh, which is completely, you know, for me at the time was a, an utter surprise. The link between this and the Shakespeare stuff might seem quite odd, but everything I'd kind of learned from researching Shakespeare and violence and so on, broadly speaking, a lot of the same discourses and ideas and arguments were the same, largely around sex and violence, the ills of sex and violence and the danger and the kind of cultural disintegration that it can lead to. So I was particularly enthused by this, but uh, needed some guidance really. And at the time was a, an amazing associate dean by the name of Wendy Leakes, who still kind of sits on my shoulder. Uh, she was absolutely inspiring and incredibly supportive uh, of a module that was dealing with hardcore porn and history and supported the screening of this material as well for study purposes. Um, so I was very nervous about it, but very fortunate, very well supported. Uh, the inspiration was, was, was certainly there. Uh, but then that launched me into a whole thing about how, how do you teach this? And do you just adopt the same kind of approaches as you would with anything else? Um, I quickly found out that you know we needed to establish ground rules with the class. Uh, the class themselves, the students, perpetually brilliant, absolutely superb in terms of their engagement with material, brilliant at attendance as well. It was a really well attended module. 
Uh, but their kind of level of involvement and interest and being able to speak kind of casually, openly and freely at the time, uh, again, for me, that was, that was really reassuring. But we did kind of lay down some ground rules because there was a lot of uncertainty about how do you talk about this? If I'm going to analyze a scene of hardcore porn on the screen and talk about it in the classroom, what terminology do I use? So I had to do quite a bit of work in terms of establishing ground rules about common use of the kinds of explicit language we would use and what that would be referring to and doing it so that there was a degree of confidence when it came to applying what was basically relatively simple film theory history uh, analysis of genre style and so on applying those things to uh, explicit subject um, material we obviously had to get you know one of the biggest things to get out of the way was the idea that this material is generally produced for masturbation and as soon as that was talked about in the class about listen we know that's what it's for but we're interested in industry we're interested in identity and culture and politics and it is deeply 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 research informed as well because there is you know a good wealth of material that's already out there not least of all uh, linda williams's groundbreaking book hardcore which frankly should have been the end of any further studies because it's kind of so much of it is is there Nevertheless, like many of these areas, it's diversified hugely. Uh, and there's some amazing kind of research that, that, that goes on in this field now. So for the purposes of teaching this, it became something that um, I found was a suitable space as well for the development of, of my own research, space for kind of research support in the curriculum. Indeed, it became a bit of a, um, a model, not this, frankly, not sex on screen, but we had a model in the department wherein we tried to make sure that staff specialisms could be dealt with through option modules. So we had people who were active as researchers and who were publishing and writing about their particular fields. And there was these spaces, these modules to do this. And that was something that I adopted um, with this. And so was very fortunate then to, to kind of take this and keep revising it and adapting it. Uh, and then collaborating with uh, a colleague in the department I mentioned, Claire Hines, uh, to produce this edited collection, um, Hard to Swallow. The structure of this was basically based on the module, and I suspect that's not terribly surprising nor, nor uh, really kind of uncommon. But it does say something about the need to kind of find space within our curricula to not just teach these subjects, but to explore them and to make those links directly into uh, our uh, research as well. So that the module became something of a, a template for the, uh, the edited collection. The idea behind this was really quite straightforward, even though both Claire and I, you know, it was the first time we were both really kind of exploring uh, this, this subject uh, at this level, really. And we've done our own kind of research. We both had backgrounds in, in uh, slightly different areas as well. Claire had done some amazing stuff around kind of gender politics, and she's now, you know, an absolute leading scholar around kind of masculinity and James Bond and, and, and those kinds of things. But this project, I think, for us was, was really a huge learning curve and really, really quite um, meaningful as well. But as I say, the, the, the aim behind it was, was something really quite simple, which was really thinking about how do very basic approaches and methodologies to film studies apply to hardcore pornography? Uh, can you adopt an approach of kind of semiotic uh, analysis and historical analysis? And what does that happen? Uh, sorry, what happens when you, when you do that in the context of, of hardcore porn? We put a call out, so a call for papers kind of went out uh, and we got some fantastic proposals that kind of came back. Uh, looking at matters of genre history, close analysis, so stuck really well to, to the call uh, for papers. But we also kind of uh, were keen to, to try and build a network around this as well, to try and draw together scholars that we didn't know if there was a kind of field that was established at this, at this point. And indeed, there were people who were collaborating and, and, and working as well. So it was a bit of a canny move on our part to really quite cheekily interpolate ourselves into this into this field and it's it's put me in good stead since and i'm entirely grateful because a number of the contributors are people that uh, are still colleagues uh, as well what we found really was this you know idea about these kind of contradictory states of things like pornography as being kind of known and unknown you know effectively culturally ubiquitous and yet still kind of socially uh, feared we took inspiration from we, we had a trip to new york which was a, a student festival. We went to a film festival in New York. Um, and Claire and I, who were part of that, 
took the opportunity to go to the, the Museum of Sex. Uh, and this really kind of inspired us. And this, this ended up featuring in the introduction because the culture of how Mo Sex, the Museum of Sex in, in New York, dealt with its subject matter was, we thought was really quite uh, inspiring. Uh, it was kind of playful, it was surprising, it was accessible, uh, it was for a kind of wider audience, of course, and yet it was still informative and educational and contentious um, as well. And that became a kind of ethos, really, I think, for how we worked through the uh, edited collection and that kind of thing. Interesting things that emerged from that was that we, we did, you know, wrote directly to some people, as you do, about, listen, we'd really love for you to write for this. And we, we kind of constantly had people agreeing to. So we were really, really grateful uh, for that. Uh, and, it, and it worked out really, really well. Uh, there was one person that we got in touch who, who uh, recently passed, unfortunately. Fantastic chap by the name of Brian McNair, who'd written about striptease culture and um, uh, uh, porno chic and things like this. And we got in touch with with him to say, listen, we've got this collection. We'd really love you to write for it. Are you interested? And uh, he said he'd seen the call for papers, but thought it was um, a joke. He thought it was someone who dropped this kind of uh, a fake call into numerous mailing lists and so steered clear of it, even though he said he was interested in it. So he said he was grateful we'd got in touch directly and that it was serious. That really says something about the field at the time and, and for an established academic as, as Brian was as well to think, is this really happening? Is, that, is someone actually doing something around just basic analysis of hardcore porn? Uh, but I think it's really illustrative of, of what was going on in the field at the time. And that was only around 20, nine, ten or so. We ended up publishing in 2012 uh, with that. For myself, I had a kind of particular interest and, and still do uh, around kind of 1970s um, hardcore and the hardcore pornography, uh, particularly because it's a, a very contentious um, period. The porn wars of the 1980s, anti-porn uh, movement as well, you know, emerged out of uh, this time uh, and, and have really, you know, continued to be the bedrock of much critical thinking that still informs popular cultural understanding today about the dangers of pornography, porn addiction, and uh, all of those things, um, which I think is, is, is fascinating. And I find the 1970s something I keep returning to uh, in my work as well. And even when I when I don't focus on things around the 1970s, I'm looking at films that seem to have some tangential relationship to that period uh, as well. What I found in researching for, for this piece was um, an incredibly diverse range of films uh, that tested film form. They kind of provoked audiences. They were challenging screen form, sexual cultures. So I wrote about Behind the Green Door, uh, which is regarded as a golden age classic, but it is also a misogynistic rape fantasy as well. It's a film that explores women's sexuality and agency in a porn film that repeatedly kind of adopts and rejects typical kind of porn narrative conventions. And it's made by the Mitchell brothers. So we've got two men who are, uh, it's through their perspective, through their lens. And yet it kind of flirts with this whole notion of women's sexuality, women's agency, and still, as I mentioned, is, is, is deeply problematic as a film, but it's neither solely or wholly kind of one thing or the other, from my perspective, which I found uh, really quite fascinating. It kind of adopts, as I say, kind of porn tropes and then rejects them uh, at, at the same time. Uh, and like uh, Deep Throat, which many people may, may have heard of, quite a, 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 an infamous film, from, from the same time, actually, from 1972. Um, it's evocative of a period of, of, of sex on screen history that complicated uh, film culture and certainly, you know, uh, worth kind of reappraising, even if they've got all of these kinds of contradictions uh, at, the, at the kind of centre of this. One thing that was is, is just by way of example, this is the, what's referred to in the industry as the money shot. So this is in uh, Behind the Green Door. It's a scene, it's an extended scene of ejaculation. And what's taking place here becomes a very trippy uh, moment in the film. There's this deep kind of low rumbling sound. Um, and for me, watching this the first time I saw this, so anyone who's trying to get pleasure out of this film and then is confronted with what's meant to be the most pleasurable moment in the film as this kind of psychedelic, uh, graphically overlaid image that just becomes about patterns and sound. 
will be deeply dissatisfied, I suspect, with this. And yet at the same time, it's flirting around with art house kind of conventions, experimental in form, and yet doesn't escape some of these problems about the, the kind of inherent misogyny that's there within these rape fantasies, which were very common of, of those films at the time. Um, I presented a paper based on, on this before I'd finished writing the article and was lucky enough to get it accepted at a, uh, it was the first or second Cine Access, which some, some academics will be familiar with, um, which took place in London at the, at the ICA. Uh, the thing to note here is that I, I, it was the first time I basically presented on pornography. Uh, and yeah, I suspect Cine Access at the time it was very, very early days for that conference. It still, still happens now and it's a, it's a really interesting thing that looks at film culture, extreme cinema uh, and have screenings and now is kind of dipping its toe into film production um, as well. But for me, I, I gave this paper based on this film and I noticed that in the audience was a, again another academic I greatly admire, a chap called Martin Barker. And Martin had, had done some amazing work on violence and cinema and I was very familiar with that from my work that I'd done looking at kind of Shakespeare and violence and film culture and censorship and all of these kind of things. So again, I was incredibly like, oh crap, am I in the right place? Is this where I should be? Is this, uh, or indeed, you know, I think it was and, and I thought I would just go with it, which I, which I did. But Martin Barker asked me a question and it was just one question and it, it completely has derailed everything I've ever done since. It was the most brilliant question. Uh, and, and all he asked was, how would you present this to the public? And I was confronted with, what? I don't want to present this to the public. I, and I thought, oh my God. And you know, since that actual moment, it was incredibly formative for me that, that Martin Barker asked that question about how do you present this to the public? It changed everything. It made me think of the comfortable spaces of academic conferences. It made me think about how meaningful research is in the academy, but how significant it is to get it out of the bloody academy. And but I think at the time, none of these thoughts obviously occurred to me at the moment. I was there trying to think, how do I answer Martin Barker's question? And I think I came up with some, my recollection is I came up with some kind of bizarre idea about the mass education of the entire population on the values of hardcore as being, you know, useful, but is offensive. And I don't know what I said. I think I just waffled my sense into nonsense until he thanked me to kind of shut me up. But it, it, it's a really formative moment for me because the kind of following year uh, uh, after that was when I, I gave basically my first public talk. So outside of an academic environment on kind of early hardcore stag films. Uh, this was at the first Southampton Film Week. So this was a new kind of festival. Uh, but at the same time, it was about masterclasses, it was guest talks, it uh, spanned kind of art and culture. And so it was much more than a film festival. But again, it was one of those things I thought, oh, I'll get involved in. And I've been involved with Southampton Film Week ever since because it's the amazing work that City Eye, who are based in Southampton, have continued to kind of push and do and bring together all of these organisations across the city of Southampton to contribute to the idea and importance of kind of film culture in the community. The first one that launched then, this is the one I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll contribute a talk and I'll do this on, on hardcore stag films. And uh, I, was, I was absolutely um, uh, terrified. Uh, I, 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 the technology failed, I remember that at the time, so I couldn't play the clips that I was waffling on about. Um, but at the same time, I had such an interesting reaction and response from a largely non-academic audience. And I felt very validated by it. But at the same time, there's a number of my colleagues from the university who were sitting uh, in that um, audience uh, that I was very grateful for. And again, this associate dean who, who had supported the module in its kind of early days, Wendy Leakes, um, she asked a question and she was basically correcting me on something I'd said. And again, I was entirely grateful. She picked me up on something that I'd said about representational problems in the stag film. And she said in this public forum, uh, Darren, don't you mean blah, 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 blah. And, and, and then she gave me a look, which was like, you do mean that, don't you? And I was like, oh, yeah. I, yes, I do, Wendy. It's, and it just thought everything started to kind of really fall into place. Public engagement, this idea of presenting research, how kind of 
articulate you need to be, which I don't think I was at all, but also how to communicate quite complicated and often kind of taboo subjects and the differences between academic audiences and, and public audiences uh, as, as well. So I've been involved ever since this kick started a whole series of talks then with Film Week, Southampton Film Week, which was a controversy strand that I, that I uh, used and kind of pulled together and have supported kind of uh, ever since. So it also, I think, was another moment that allowed me to think more broadly about kind of problematic sexual cultures and issues and so on. And what I want to do for the remainder of this is just kind of quickly whiz through uh, an example based on, on my research and, and that came out uh, and was published in, in uh, Tainted Love, the collection I mentioned. It was inspired by this film, which is Let the Right One In, which uh, if you're familiar with this, it's a vampire film. It tells the story of kind of Ellie and uh, Oscar, who you can see here. And I watched this film and it's a beautiful story, quite a violent at times kind of vampire film. Uh, and uh, these two at the end, oh, I'll, I'll just spoiler alert here, the two of them escape at the end because they're, they're a young couple in love and, they, and off they go. And as the film ended, I'm sitting there thinking, in a minute, he, she's a vampire and is gonna live forever. He's gonna grow into an old man in love with this child. I think I've just seen the birth of a paedophile in film. And this film is, is, is loved and critically lauded. And, and I read a number of reviews and articles and no one's really talking about what, what have I just watched here? And it just inspired a whole thing about, okay, so what's going on in terms of film and abuse narratives and these kinds of things, which set me off on, on producing the piece that I did for, um, for Tainted Love, but it's, continuing because there's so much more that's happening here. So just by way of whistle stop of this, I looked at a whole number of films and identified a, a, a number of trends and I drew on the kind of work of, um, of uh, a chap called Raymond Williams who talks about structures of feeling. So you can look at these cultural artifacts such as film and gauge what kind of you know issues, ideas, complications, moral complexities, whatever it might be, take a look at the trends in the arts and culture around you. And for me, of course, it's film to see what's being said. And I identified a number of kind of trends in the, the research I was doing, which was basically, you know, a, a number of films that deal with abuse narratives and, and how we can begin to group them and think about them. And then how we can think about how they may be improved as well. This is a film called Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane with Jodie Foster, in which Martin Sheen plays uh, what's referred to as the local uh, the local pervert and it's very much framed in the context of you know everybody kind of has one in the community and no one really knows kind of what to do with him. I also looked at this Sean Connery film so these were just uh, examples which I think was really uh, fascinating. This is largely based around an interrogation that takes place between Sean Connery's character, Trevor Howard's character. Uh, Trevor Howard's um, you know accused of uh, child abuse and, and murder uh, and Sean Connery ends up confessing in the course of this interrogation that he has similar feelings and how do you control them, what do you do? And he completely loses it because he doesn't know how to contain those feelings, how to articulate them, or indeed kind of uh, what they mean. So I began to see a particular trend in how cinema was playing out these abuse narratives, certainly centered around men who have these uh, feelings, but also have uh, these difficulties in articulating language, the pursuit of language is what these are all about. This was one of the most fascinating ones, an adaptation of a stage play called Short Eyes from 1977, in which the, the central character here basically confesses to the fact that he does um, abuse and molest children, but he's not guilty of the rape that he's been incarcerated for. This confession though uh, leaves him to his death. Uh, he's attacked by the prison inmates themselves. But again, it very much frames the whole thing around this not knowing how to articulate this, that at the time there isn't a language. And again, these are a bunch of films from the 1970s as well, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to by way of, of conclusion. The other two kinds of structures of feeling with the research that I was doing it was one about retribution and social vilification. So these were basically revenge stories. So Daddy's Little Girl and also I'll just kind of move on to the second one, Seven Days. Both focus on, you know, they're quite extreme films, extremely violent as well, but are all about kind of uh, retribution. They're all about enacting violence upon the bodies of the perpetrators. What I found significant with these is that even though these actions take place, 
the things that feature in them are very much informed by kind of tabloids, tabloid newspapers, tabloid rhetoric. They feature in the films as well about how the tabloids have written up the cases uh, and, and numerous cases, especially with, with Daddy's Little Girl. You see a number of newspaper articles that are based on real life accounts there. What transpires though in these narratives is that there's no satisfaction, there's no kind of closure. It doesn't work. These are films that basically say this kind of retribution is not going to solve uh, the problem at all. And then the third, and what I thought was the kind of final of these, uh, was based around the idea of a number of films that are much more reflective, basically, in their approach. The Silence looks at uh, issues of complicity between predatory paedophiles, but also adults who are attracted to children who don't act on them. So having this kind of differentiated approach to abuse is, is really quite new and really quite significant as a, as a narrative kind of uh, intervention there. Similarly with uh, The Hunt, which was a, a film by uh, Vinterberg that looked at someone who was innocent but accused. And the film very much focuses on the community, especially the kind of challenges to cultural attitudes, especially when the accusation is steeped in fallacy and false attribution, and that once you're accused, you can kind of never escape this. There was a real, there's a real onus in this film on people actually taking responsibility as a community to try and figure out what happened rather than follow, as we saw in those previous uh, examples about retribution, a kind of tabloid uh, and media-led kind of uh, approach as well. For me, one of the most fascinating, but also I'd say kind of disturbing is, is this film called Michael. And what Michael basically does is um, complicates the kind of popular understanding of abuse. Although it revolves around an abduction, everything in this film is incredibly mundane and very much of the ordinary. So it almost normalizes the behavior that's there. What's interesting in Michael is that, as you can see, these two characters here, the abuser and the child who's been abducted, the whole story plays out effectively kind of mirroring parent-child relationships, which if you do research around kind of social science studies around paedophilia abuse and the behavior of offenders is much more common than the idea of kind of predatory abusers uh, as well. It's clearly not a kind of interesting watch. Uh, sorry, it is an interesting watch. It's not a comfortable uh, watch at all. But I think it does kind of say something about how there's these different waves of films and they're not linked distinctly just to particular historical periods. We've seen them kind of move uh, at different periods where you've got this question about struggling for language, the idea of retribution and violence, and then things that are a bit more, and certainly in this case, they are more contemporary, ideas about being more reflective and having a bit more of a dialogue about these things in order to do something that might be a bit more significant and a, and, and a bit more better in terms of this, this idea of representation. And that's what I think is, is really interesting now. That piece I wrote kind of concluded there, and yet um, I've just been you know, uh, continuing the research around this because I'm looking now at the reports that are emerging from the IICSA. So you may be familiar in the UK uh, in 2014, I think it was, the uh, inquiry into um, uh, child sexual abuse began. Uh, and that was a, a public inquiry. It was kickstarted as a result of the Jimmy Savile uh, case. Uh, and I, I've noticed, you know, you see on screen a number of things beginning to emerge again that maybe uh, if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see the end of that, it says reparation and uh, uh, responsibility, but it's a question mark there because I'm not too sure where this research is going to take me. I've started to look at the reports that are coming out of the uh, investigation into uh, child sexual abuse, which are really, they make for a really fascinating reading. But what's happening in terms of kind of screen studies, what's happening certainly in terms of looking at the representations here are things such as National Treasure, Virtues, Three Girls, which are looking at things that are enhancing the complexities about social responsibility, questions about systemic problems, questions about how you define abuse and what that is, but all, for me, interestingly geared towards better uh, addressing the problem. So the publication of these reports is kind of coinciding with the creation of these uh, uh, film and television kind of texts as well. There's other kinds of research that's related to this for me, because again, the examples that we've got here, certainly in National Treasure and the Virtues, uh, and the, the, the actual inquiry that, that's been published at the moment, uh, all seem to have things around the 70s, sometimes the 80s. The 70s haunt this whole subject and this, this kind of whole period. And 
quite recently, um, uh, I wrote a piece for a collection that's coming out called Shockers about 70s cinema, trash, terror, and sex exploitation. And I was asked to write a piece about the move of pornography into the mainstream in America. And uh, I, I really struggled to do it because usually it's just a case of industry and looking at regulation. And the more research I did on it, the more apparent it was that the shift of porn into the mainstream in America was as much a, a kind of um, a, a cultural provocation and was very much in tune with a lot of the kind of art and cultural protest uh, at the time as well, that there was something much more interesting uh, kind of going on way beyond just matters of screen industries uh, and regulation. It came at a time of this thing about kind of culture wars and there's some really kind of interesting things that I'm beginning to find in terms of research that is informing some of these kinds of screen representations. Just as an aside, and I've mentioned this in, in, in past papers and, and presentations as well, some of the research I did revealed a, a 1977 petition that was launched in France uh, calling for the decriminalization of all um, uh, uh, consenting relations between children and, and adults and the assumption that young children can, can offer consent, which is a very thorny issue, especially around drawing the line between consent and compliance. Um, but this, this particular petition was signed by public intellectuals such as Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Roland Barthes, uh, th these, these, these people that we still kind of uh, are fascinated by in terms of cultural history, critical theory, uh, and I'm really keen to kind of get my teeth into what was going on at that time that kind of fostered that particular culture. I think this is kind of where we are now. The reason I mention this, and just by way of kind of starting to, to conclude, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm probably going over time here. I don't think that what's going on in this, what was happening in the 70s into the 80s is too dissimilar to what we're seeing now, certainly in terms of the need for positive interventions to address kind of historical failures, a number of cultural matters, not least of all the areas I'm interested in with regards to kind of sexual cultures and, and sexual identities. And certainly what I'm doing along with another, a number of colleagues and, and partnered with, as I've mentioned, uh, Dr. Donna Pebody, this is all really for me part of a, a wider project, the Screening uh, Sex Project, which is a, a platform, a collaborative kind of um, effort. It's a public facing website for those of you who don't know. It's also a scholarly interest group. We've got an international network, which we're very grateful for. And recently kind of developed a charter in collaboration with a number of, of organizations, uh, which is great, which we're about to kind of, uh, you know, launch and get out there and have more people, signatories uh, involved in that. We also wrote a provocation for uh, a, a film competition, which was 16 days, 16 films, which looked at kind of abuse narrative, domestic violence in, in in particular um, which came out of the screening sex project and we've just began our book series for Edinburgh University Press which began all the way back to that conference on transnational monstrosity so I'm very grateful for being in the, the, the wrong place perhaps uh, at, at the right time and just by way of conclusion you know what we're working on next which we, we would love more people to get involved in is particular to to Southampton screening sex Southampton looking at the sexual story uh, of a city it's kind of informed by data around domestic violence and sexual abuse and so on but it's about re-narrativizing that and looking at ways in which we can kind of map support for sexual cultures, sexual identities across the city because there's a number of fantastic organizations and we're looking for more and more of those people to uh, to get uh, involved uh, really so overall, uh, the, the, my research, the things I'm interested in, it's, it's, it's largely and quite simply about wanting to improve the kind of representation of sex and sexual cultures, not shy away from taboo topics and to adopt really a kind of more um, research uh, informed approach, certainly in, in wanting to take it beyond academia and collaborate and work with through things like the charter, arts and cultural organizations to tackle thorny issues around representation and, and identity, and of course, make the world a better place as well. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to shut up for a while now, and I think we've got a bit of time for questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. Fascinating, fascinating conversation. Um, I, I, think, I think your presentation really, really uh, uh, gave us some, some food for thought. Um, your journey, your stories of the conferences was a great start and, and, and the contradictions you felt not only in the conferences but also in the classrooms and, and the predicaments, especially in your early days, was really fascinating to hear. 
And, and I think <coughs> giving, giving this very uh, delicate topic, um, taboo, if you like also, uh, is it um, to give, it, give this an academic voice by appreciating um, the social context and the cultural ac acceptability are, are, are things we, we really do not talk enough of, I think. And there are, there are indeed deep-seated issues um, uh, which, uh, which are, of course, uh, depicted on, on screen and to, to, uh, to, to understand what exactly is depicted there. And, and the bit that you said towards the, towards the end about, you know, about, about the uh, compliance and the consent, uh, mm. that really opens a big can of worms, isn't it? That's, 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 that's a big topic. <laughs> it really does. I, I think fortunately with, with, with a, a lot of this, it's, it forces you into interdisciplinary work. You can't yes. do this really in isolation and just in a world of, of, of kind of film studies. And I think, you know, I, I, there's a lot of people I know, a lot, a lot of colleagues and a lot of people who've interacted with the screening sex stuff who do brilliant work in kind of breaking out beyond just kind of some of those limited, limited fields. And for me, it, that, that offered me a degree of, of security, frankly, that there's work that's been going on for many years in terms of social sciences mm. and behavioral studies that made me, you know, gave me a framework with which to approach representation on screen. And then wanting to kind of come, come back, come full circle and think, okay, so how can we begin to work as researchers with arts, cultural organizations, film organizations as well, to offer, you know, a, a, a better informed approach to some of these subjects, even if they are quite challenging and taboo culturally. Right. No, th th thank you. So I think I think we have got about five minutes or so, so we can take a few questions, Darren, if that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I see. There's there's one from Mark in the chat that says, "Interested to know where this sort of research may go next. Are there areas relating to sex on screen that have received very little attention so far?" I'm sure there are. I'm too self-serving to move out of my own little area of the things that I'm interested in. Uh, I think, you know, there's, there's some really interesting stuff. I, I'm, I'm on the editorial board for, for Porn Studies, the first sort of journal that, that Routledge launched about um, pornography. And, and looking at the work that they do is, is absolutely excellent because it's a, an incredibly supportive and open forum to look at different national cultures, national identities, and different kind of sexual behaviors uh, around those things, a kind of much more intersectional approach as well. So there's, there's plenty of work going on there. I suspect there's actually, you know, in answer to your question, Mark, the areas that appear to have very little attention have had some attention, but they need to kind of reach out above and beyond just kind of journal publications uh, and academic conferences as well, uh, certainly in my, my opinion. Uh, there's a point here from Graham about how important do you feel it is to bring research into the classroom uh, as soon as possible. Can you talk a little more about the ordering of these elements? Does research need to come first, teaching second? I, I don't have a kind of clear structural plan to that. I, I think, you know, it, it sounds really, um, I don't want to sound particularly stupid, but I do really believe that if you put yourself in, in a situation and you don't quite know how it's going to play out, it is worth doing um, because there's really kind of nothing to lose. So it wasn't by absolute design that, uh, you know, research in the classroom and talking about those things uh, became, you know, something that was, there's an absolute ambition. It was certainly a model that uh, predated my time where those areas of specialisms were used and I'd certainly you know encourage that the scope within certainly our institution's academic framework to do that and to have those options that can be led by staff just as much as they may be by by sort of student need as well um, got a question from Isaac hello Isaac good to not see you but know that you're there how do you approach public engagement with this type of research I think as I say it's a, it's a real kind of uh, learning curve I think the best things that you can do is actually be collaborating and working with other organizations I'm incredibly grateful to City Eye and Southampton Film Week for providing a public forum in Southampton that I can kind of confidently and with the support of others take some of this work I am not in any way, shape or form doing this in, in isolation and, and, and being valiant on some kind of charge. It involves a, a number of people, a number of people who support and, uh, and give you some faith in that. But I would say collaboration is absolutely uh, the key with regards to that, certainly in terms of, of public engagement. And looking out for opportunities where you can almost um, take your work slightly outside of these academic theories and frameworks 
and talk, you know, like you would in a conversation. It goes back to the, the Martin Barker question for me uh, about having to really work out how you would do this uh, publicly when it's, you know, often kind of a, a quiet, contentious uh, subject. And I know Isaac does amazing research about uh, issues on kind of masculinity, men and, and rape as well, which again is a, a very contentious and, and not really, you know, so much work that can be done there. But Isaac's been kind of leading the field in that. Um, one from Kay Sunshine. Have you faced any backlash due to your research on sex, sexual violence? Will you ever do research on pornography in terms of racial identity, stereotype, racial dynamics? I know people who do research those areas of race and they would do it far better than, than, than I could uh, as well. Um, so that work is kind of going on and, and is, is happening. I've been lucky, I think, not to have any particular backlash, but it doesn't mean I've not been riddled with anxiety and worry and nerves uh, in tackling these but I've always been attracted to kind of horror and violence and sex on screen and those kinds of things um, as well. There's only been one instance at a conference, um, it was a Mexa conference a few years ago where uh, there, was, there was, I don't know if it was a backlash but it was, it was probably a bit of a backlash um, about the fact that I was talking about some films and asking, you know, there's an opportunity to rethink some of these films that have been caught up in the porn wars of the 80s, the kind of um, uh, anti-porn feminism. And it's difficult to kind of challenge those things because so much of the pornography was. One of the biggest problems I have in terms of dealing with any backlash is that we still think of pornography as this monolithic thing rather than actually, you know, as is mentioned in there, pornography in terms of racial identity, stereotypes, racial dynamics, in terms of class, culture, national identity, all the other kind of niche areas. I think one of the best things that, that can be done for pornography is move away from this idea it's a monolithic thing uh, because there is problematic pornography but there's also incredibly ethical alternative approaches to porn and porn filmmaking as well. Um, we tend to lump them all into to, to one area. And a lot of the research has already moved beyond that, but popular opinion uh, really kind of hasn't. Um, and then from Hannah Lake, hello Hannah. Uh, have you noticed a shift in sex representation in film and TV as a result of the Me Too movement? Um, I haven't so much, but I think what's fascinating with that, I, I, there's, there's things that have become uh, definitely more about consent. So I was lucky enough uh, with, with, uh, with my partner to kind of um, liaise with the Consent Academy. We were at a conference in Seattle uh, and the Consent Academy that's based there, we arranged a meeting with them to talk about that. And we said, what's missing from kind of film and TV narratives in your opinion? And it was like, we never see the moment of consent when someone consents to sex. It's often the man, talking about mainstream films now, the man might walk up to the woman and just launch his mouth onto hers and there's never any narratives of, of consent there. We've seen that certainly grow, certainly in long form TV series as well, uh, uh, Netflix series and the like. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting around the kind of the, the, the Me Too moment is, is about ownership as well, about how many uh, women-led narratives are now obviously making their, their way through the industry. And from my perspective, it's still a pitiful amount. The fact we're making history by virtue of the fact that one or two women are being Oscar nominated is it's, it's a cause for celebration, but it's also a bit of a desperate uh, 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 point really to think is, is that really as far as we've got when we've known this for a long time i suspect there'll be much more that will come out of this as documentaries of course around kind of me too and so on as well that are worth worth looking at thank you okay Helen. i think that's about it from the the chat and i think we're probably out of time that yeah is. thank you thank you so much darren and and thank you shimantak um I'm sorry to have to stop it there. It's it's been an absolutely fascinating talk um, and a really really interesting session. Thank you. Um, as Thank you know, you. this is one of a series of events, so so please do keep an eye on our website for, for further details. Our next lecture is on uh, the Friday, the 14th of May, and will be delivered by Philippa Felicia, who's our head of education and sociology and associate professor in the sociology of sport here at Solon. So I, I very much hope you can join us for that. Um, but once again, thank you so much to Darren and, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.